don't know how many times we've been trying to get this message out, yet here we have three young lives lost. Tonight, a northern Manitoba community in mourning. Here we are. If we live on this land, we need to go as far as it takes. More arrests over the weekend at the Kinder Morgan site in Burnaby. They don't have that support of housing, they end up back on the streets. And calls for the federal government to invest in social housing. Good evening, I'm Brittany Hobson. We begin this evening with some tragic news. A community in northern Manitoba is in mourning after three young boys were struck by a car and killed Saturday evening. RCMP has charged a man from the community of Nichisawishik Cree Nation with three counts of impaired driving causing death. 27-year-old Todd Linklater has also been charged with failing to stay at the scene of an accident. The incident occurred around 10.30 p.m. Saturday evening just outside the northern community, also known as Nelson House, approximately 700 kilometers north of Winnipeg. The three boys, two aged 11 and one 13, were out walking and biking along an access road into the community when they were hit. Two were on foot, one was on a bike, doing what most kids do, riding around in their community, having fun. Saturday night, springtime is here, so I can imagine this. <laughs> they haven't been on their bikes much yet now, the anticipation of getting out and for them to be struck by an impaired driver. I don't know how many times we've been trying to get this message out, yet here we have three young lives lost. The boys have been identified as Keith and Lobster, Mateo Moore Spence, and Terrence Spence. On Sunday, police confirmed alcohol was a factor, and after briefly fleeing the scene on foot, Link later turned himself in. It was devastating. It was to, to hear that alcohol was involved. I was hoping it wouldn't. Alcohol wouldn't be involved, but it 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 had a role, I guess. A vigil is planned in the community for Monday evening. Nelson House Chief Marcel Moody says the community is trying to come to terms in its own way. We're going to start our healing journey for our nation because there's been so many people impacted by this tragic loss. It's going to be a difficult process, but I mean, with the help and support from everybody in the community, I think we'll, we'll, we'll manage. A GoFundMe account has been set up to cover funeral costs and to build a safe bike trail in memory of the boys. The entrance to Kinder Morgan's Burnaby Tank Farm was busy this past weekend. Seven more protesters were arrested for defying a court injunction. And people living at Camp Cloud woke to graffiti spray painted by vandals. APTN's Lori Hamlin has the details. Protesters not welcome and F off go home was spray painted by vandals throughout different parts of Camp Cloud late Friday night. The camp, set up as a surveillance post last November, sits directly across from the front gate of Kinder Morgan's Burnaby Tank Farm. Grace Burke, one of 10 permanent residents at Camp Cloud, says she was initially scared. I did feel a little bit scared because I was sleeping in the women's cabin when it happened and they spray painted all over the door, but uh, after seeing the level of support we're receiving in response, I feel safe. I feel glad that I'm here. The water protectors have now fixed some of the mess. We did cover some of the graffiti. Uh, no protesters not welcome. We changed to, we just covered up the knot with the heart so it says protesters welcome. And uh, we did, so we did cover over some, but we didn't. We haven't cleaned it up yet just because we want people to see what happened. But graffiti isn't the only problem. The city of Burnaby put up cement barriers along the street early Friday morning to help protect the camp's residents from people speeding by. Some drivers have been aggressive and threatening. A lot of the times people speed by, they're drunk drivers who go by here quite often and they can be quite aggressive. RCMP have not been called in to investigate. Meanwhile, on Saturday, over 100 protesters representing all different faiths joined together to block Kinder Morgan's main gate. Seven more protesters were arrested by RCMP for breaching a court injunction that prohibits anyone from going within five meters of the oil giant's two Burnaby facilities. 
That makes the total of arrests more than 200 since March. I do respect the law when and where it's just, but where an injunction is in this case is, uh, is um, um, basically preventing, um, is it supporting the Kinder and the Morgan pipeline to be built with, with drastic repercussions for the future and the future generations, then I feel there's grounds there uh, legally, morally, civilly to, um, to oppose it. Vivian Seegers, who grew up near Alberta's tar sands, says no matter what faith people believe in, everyone has common values and must share in protecting the earth. The water is in danger and the water is so important. And so here we are. If we live on this land, we need to go as far as it takes. Lori Hamlin, APTN National News, Burnaby. And we would like to hear what you have to say about this or any other story. Here's how to contact us. Send an email to news at aptn.ca, like our APTN National News Facebook page, follow us on Twitter at APTN News, or go to our website, aptnnews.ca. Thunder Bay, Ontario is welcoming evacuees from the Kashechewan First Nation. The community declared a state of emergency due to flooding. Thunder Bay has offered to take in 450 evacuees. Many of them have already arrived. Flooding along the west shore of James Bay has become an annual problem for the community. More than 600 chiefs from across Canada are gathering in Gatineau this week for a special chiefs assembly. We'll give you a sneak peek at some of the topics up for discussion. That's coming up after the break. Here's a look at Tuesday's weather forecast starting on the East Coast, plus 5 in St. John's, overcast and 10 above in Charlottetown, a sunny plus 10 in Happy Valley Goose Bay, plus 3 in La Grande, plus 17 in Montreal, cloudy and 14 above in Val d'Or, Sunny skies in most of southern Ontario, plus 20 in Peterborough, plus 24 in Windsor. 22 above in Timmins, a cooler plus 5 in Sioux Lookout. In northern Manitoba, sun and plus 11 in Flin Flon and the Paw. Some clouds in plus 9 in Dauphin, 10 above in Winnipeg. In Saskatchewan, plus 15 in Swift Current in Saskatoon. To the north, 10 above in Buffalo Narrows. Sun and plus eight in Uranium City. Welcome back. The AFN is holding a special Chiefs Assembly on federal legislation this week. Tom Fenario will be covering the meeting. He joins us now from Ottawa. So thanks for joining us. So Tom, what can you expect from this week's special Chiefs Assembly? Well, the AFN will only be discussing topics dealing with federal legislation at this two-day meeting. So chiefs will be in sessions on the Indigenous Languages Act, the First Nations Financial Transparency Act, Bill S-3, and uh, Bill C-262. That's the private member's bill introduced by NDP MP Romeo Staganash, otherwise known as the UN DRIP Act. That's to ensure that the laws of Canada are in harmony with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Uh, Chiefs will also be talking about the Safe Drinking Water Act, environmental and regulatory reviews, and implementing legislation. Uh, you'll remember the federally created recognition and implementation of Indigenous Rights Framework. Uh, Prime Minister Trudeau announced that back in February. Uh, that's the framework that is said to be the basis for all relations between Indigenous people and the federal government going forward. Uh, Crown Indigenous Relations Minister Carolyn Bennett held a couple of national engagement sessions that will continue uh, into the spring regarding this framework. Uh, they say that the framework will be introduced sometime in 2018 and implemented by 2019. So that's going to be a big topic on the table here. Aside from the more than 600 chiefs that are expected at these meetings, who else will we see there this week? Um, well, ministers will participate in the opening uh, of both days. Crown Indigenous Relations Minister Carolyn Bennett will be there, of course. Uh, the Heritage Minister uh, will be there, as well as Jane Philpott, Minister of Indigenous Services. Those are all on the schedule. Um, on Tuesday afternoon, leaders from each federal political party will address chiefs in attendance. Uh, and Brittany, it's important to note that this is the last AFN meeting before the election for National Chief in July, so I imagine that'll be a hot topic amongst all the chiefs there 
folks will be, uh, anyone in the running for the national chief position will be looking for votes. Hey, well, thanks, Tom, for giving the, us that preview. We'll be sure to uh, look ahead. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Brittany. Monday, the Native Women's Shelter of Montreal issued a challenge to the Trudeau government. They say social housing will improve the lives of Indigenous women in the city, and it's time for the feds to step up. Tom Fenario has the story. So you're, all you're done. It's for all the done. Yep. Right? Yep. Brenda Lee Marcoux is here to show her support for the Native Women's Shelter of Montreal. The Interior Salish woman credits the shelter for helping her get off the streets. And I was lucky enough to go to the Native Women's Shelter to find the shelter and to go and stay there. And after 12 weeks to be, I was one of the lucky ones that got, I filled out applications and I got housing. But the shelter says not every story has Brenda's outcome. According to the shelter's president, too many of the women they serve end up back in abusive situations once they leave. That's always the problem is that they leave and they try and then things don't work out and they come back. If you don't have that support of housing, and that's, you know, a lot of people who are in the Housing First project say they don't have that support of housing, they end up back on the streets. Naguzet says the shelter wants to provide social housing to their clients once they leave the shelter. Called Miss Cusawin, it's been a decade in the works. 30 units of subsidized housing, many for Indigenous families with on-site social services and community spaces. They've found a building in an ideal location. Now they need funding to the tune of $7 million. It's a long time overdue and uh, it'd be really great if, you know, Prime Minister Trudeau wanted to help pay for it. We now have before us an opportunity to deliver true, meaningful and lasting reconciliation between Canada and First Nations, the Métis Nation and Inuit peoples. Naguset specifically referenced Justin Trudeau's September 2017 UN speech, where he committed to improving the lives of Indigenous people. She thinks Ms. Cusawin is an opportunity for the federal government to put its money where its mouth is. When Mr. Trudeau said no relationship is more important to this government than with the Indigenous people, we believe him and we will welcome his support. Indigenous and Northern Affairs Canada was unable to respond before deadline. For her part, Marcoux says she no longer wants to be the exception to the rule. She would like to see Montreal's disproportionate amount of homeless Indigenous women in homes. And she thinks Ms. Cusawin and the shelter are the solution. Really what they do is help you get back on your feet and start your life again. And that's what happened to me. And uh, so this is really exciting. Tom Fenario, APTN <laughs> National News, Montreal. Time for another quick break, but stick around. We've got more APTN National News for you after these short messages. Here's a look at the rest of Tuesday's weather forecast, picking back up in northern Alberta, 13 above in Fort McMurray and Grand Prairie, cloudy skies to the south, a high of plus 12 in Medicine Hat and Lethbridge, over to BC, a sunny plus 14 in Vancouver, plus 12 in Port Hardy, in northern BC, plus 11 in clouds in Sandspit and Prince Rupert, cooler temperatures in the Yukon, a high of 1 in Rock River and 7 in Old Crow, over to NWT, Sun and plus 12 in Trout Lake, 15 above in Fort Simpson, a cooler plus 3 in Colville Lake and Anubik, sunny and chilly in parts of Nunavut, minus 11 in Whale Cove, minus 14 in Cambridge Bay, minus 16 in Joe Haven and Resolute for Tuesday. To New Zealand now. The fate of more than 1,500 students remains uncertain after the announcement that partnership schools would join the state system or close. Partnership schools are owned by private sponsors, are not bound by New Zealand curriculum, and are contracted by the Ministry of Education. Here are our colleagues at Maori TV with more. It's 6.45 a.m. in Marae Napier, and Nevada Campbell's ready to start. Nevada is a Year 13 student at the Aratika Academy, a partnership school for boys in Wakatu Hastings.
Afterwards, no other school would take him except Te Aratika. When I was in there, it just, like, it really hit me. Like, I had no sense of direction. I didn't know where I was going. And then coming to Te Aratika, I've learned that um, having a clear vision is key to know, where, to know where you are going in the future. Yeah. To fuel them for a day of learning, Te Aratika's school day starts with breakfast. The academy was established last year by a civil construction firm contracted by the Ministry for Education. They had just three months to find a school site, registered teachers and a student role. For us, first term, second term, with our boys, our teachers knew everything chaos. But when term three hit, we settled. And then our boys settled, and then we were able to move them and achieve their targets. It's that, eh? Is that it? No, that, that's not even meant to be in there. But that's quite good. <laughs> While the boys were settling in in Term 3, the school was keeping one eye on Parliament. In its pre-election announcement, Labour said partnership schools would close if they were elected. Now they're keeping their promise. We've been very clear that we don't like the charter school model and we're not going to continue with the charter school model. But there's a, the, I acknowledge that for the Māori education providers in particular, there is a real desire to have a, a bit more of a by Māori, for Māori focus, and we certainly want to see how we can accommodate that better within the public education system. One of the state school models Te Aratika Academy is considering is a designated character school. The supports, the restrictions under a public, public school compared to a charter school model is unknown for us. We have concerns, but we're committed to making um, informed choices. Uh, we're committed to talking and um, working the best pathway. Yeah, I <laughs> After the initial establishment fee, further funding could be paid by the government to close Te Aratika Academy earlier than was contracted. Wellington-based advocate Catherine Isaac says making them convert to a designated character school ignores their achievements. It's very frustrating and very disappointing for them. I mean, even, for example, uh, the two secondary schools that opened in 2014, so they've only been going a very short time, are actually already well exceeding the national average in NCEA achievement and they're significantly ahead of the national average for Māori achievement. So they're, they're going really well. Give these schools a few more years and I think the results will be very, very positive. But um, it looks like they're not going to have that chance. Isaac once led the board which helped to approve and monitor the partnership schools. They resigned last month in protest at the Minister of Education's plans to abolish them. I think it's purely ideological. They've made a promise to do this and they're going ahead with it, despite the evidence that, and that shows quite clearly that these schools are doing really well. No, the, Labour Party, the, the Minister Party says unregistered teachers, flexible curriculums and profit-making are the reasons he opposes partnership schools. But the partnership schools we spoke to says it's not about money, but their students' success. We've got um, performance outcomes, measures that we need to achieve, and um, it's really stringent as a partnership school. We were really happy with our outcomes for 2017. It was a great report, and we had a great celebration. The Ministry of Education's changes have delayed the setup of four partnership schools, including one led by iwi-owned tertiary institute, Tūranga Araro in Gisborne. After four applications, they were approved in September last year and paid an establishment fee of around $660,000. <laughs>
but things didn't go as planned. There was a gap of about five, five months where we just sat, we just sat. We, we couldn't do anything because Labour was still deciding what they were going to do. The STEM school would have been located on this campus owned by Te Runanga o Tūranga Nui Ākiwa. So over here from this, from that white truck, right around, right around. The model they're looking at now is an integrated state school with parents and whānau leading it. Governance is our rangatiratanga. That's us having our own right over our school. But we know we have to work together with, with um, joint partnership. We know we have to work with the government. We understand that, but we want, we want ownership of our own space as well. Um, this is us making our own choices at a strategic level. Partnership schools have been given until May the 1st to apply to become a designated character school, a state-owned school with special character. Here in the Waikato, Taiwananga has been a designated character school since 2011, with campuses in Hamilton and Palmerston North. So our vision is Kia Tu, Kia Ora, Kia Māori. So under Kia Tu, it's about achievement and leadership. Under Kia Ora, it's about um, health and wellbeing. Under Kia Māori, it's about us being successful as Māori. So that's a point of difference because we define our character. Oh, we got the same answer, G. Yeah, high five, I eh? think that's awesome. Taiwananga principal Toby Westrip says partnership schools shouldn't lose their original vision and reason for establishing themselves. It's advice partnership schools are taking into their negotiations with the Ministry of Education. For teachers, parents and students, closing is the last option. If we were closed, we would make sure that they are in a safe place. Um, that our job won't be done because we close. Our job will be done when each and every boy is placed in a safe place that will grow them and is committed to growing them. So this means going back to our to the lives that we lived before this, before coming to Tiaratika. So it's going back to like being a statistic in the number a uh, number in the mainstream system. And it's it just means getting lost again. And that's your na APTN National News for this Monday. For news anytime, visit our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Brittany Hobson. Have a great night. We'll see you back here tomorrow.